Okay, today we are going to be talking about the school to prison pipeline. I'm Dr. Karen Graham. Um, I've done quite a bit of research around the school experiences of men that go to prison. And today's session will be an introduction to the concept, the school to prison pipeline. A brief overview of some of my research on the school experiences of former prisoners. Uh, this research emerged from my time as a prison teacher. And then also I'm going to draw on some classic sociological theories of education um, to discuss some of the connections between social control and education. Um, also, to conclude, I'll encourage you to think about what looking at the school to prison pipeline can tell us about the entire system of education. OK, so the concept the school to prison pipeline is um, generally the idea that negative school outcomes, especially school exclusion, can lead to criminal offending. The term came out of the US, um, mainly around a time where there was increasing zero tolerance approach to school discipline, um, combined with police officers, an increasing number of police officers in schools. Um, both of these approaches led to a direct link between um, what was happening on the school corridors and the criminal justice system. So where previously a school principal may have dealt with um, disciplinary issues, instead the on-site police officer would do so. And um, increasingly arrests were made for what were um, previously school behaviour infractions. So this leads to this, this in, enmeshing of um, school corridors and courtrooms and prison wings. And so the, there is a, the, the idea is that there's a direct push out of the school into the criminal justice system. Um, so yes, this happened, the term came out of the US and we see an increasing practice in the US, but how does this link to the UK um, and what's increasingly being termed the UK school to prison pipeline? Um, so first of all, we've got some statistics on the links between um, education or schooling and prison in the UK. So um, figures from the Prison Reform Trust show that 42% of prisoners have been expelled or permanently excluded from school. Um, and just over half of people entering prison are assessed as having literacy skills expected of an 11 year old. And this is over three times higher than in the general adult population. So we see here that there is some connection between negative school outcomes and those that make up the uh, prison population in the UK. So I mentioned in the introduction that I, I myself have done some research around um, the school experiences of men that go to prison. Um, this research project grew out of two backgrounds that I have. So one, I, I grew up myself in a community and indeed a family where men going to prison uh, was not unusual. I also began my teaching practice 20 years ago in two adult male prisons in the Midlands. Um, during that professional practice, and also I think coming um, to some extent from my personal experience of knowing people, um, men who had gone to prison, I noticed two things. Um, so during uh, my experience at one prison in the Midlands, I spoke to hundreds of men um, in the weekly induction about their prior experiences of education. And of hundreds of men that I spoke to, different ages, different ethnicities, religions, um, personalities, hometowns that they came from in the UK, they all appeared to share a strikingly similar experience of school. Alongside this, I also noticed that um, men in the main population appeared to be relatively well adjusted to life in prison. So by this, I don't mean that they were enjoying prison or, you know, prison is a holiday camp, as some, as some people um, might be led to believe. But actually, um, there was a, 
um, a kind of relative, and, and I use the word relative because it is a relative ease with which living in what um, a lot of people would find very difficult circumstances, they were able to cope. These two things I noticed and I felt that perhaps there was something um, going on in terms of prior experiences before coming to prison that, that may in some way um, prepare people, young, young men and older men, for the experience that they had whilst being incarcerated. Um, so what I did to investigate this further is I did um, in-depth life history interviews with former prisoners, focusing on their school experiences and their experiences in prison. I interviewed um, 11 men between the ages of 20s and 60s, so um, quite a range in terms of the era in which they were educated. Um, nonetheless, um, not unlike the hundreds of men that I spoke to during my teaching practice, there were some really common themes that emerged across all of the interviews. So of all the men I interviewed, um, each of them were identified as problematic pupils very early in their schooling. They all received um, official exclusions, some more than others, um, and all received what, what could be considered poor educational outcomes. More significantly, they experienced school on the margins or the outskirts of the, ma of the majority. So they narrated a story of their schooling that was actually quite unusual compared to what a lot of people would say about their schooling. And this consisted of um, experience frequently um, arbitrary punitive practices. So lots of punishments and often um, for things that we would not necessarily consider punishable offences, whether they are um, education in an education setting or in a social setting. They all experience physical isolation. They experience segregation and, um, from their peers and exclusion from education itself. So this was as, as distinct from physical isolation. Um, they typically had restricted peer networks, so only um, had networks with other pupils, other students, other children, young people who were similarly placed, so similarly placed on the margins or the outskirts of the schooling system. And they also, um, in various ways, experienced um, a kind of climate of imminent violence, whether this was um, for the older men in the cohort that I interviewed, they went to school when um, corporal punishment was still liberally used in schools. They experienced a lot of that um, from schools and indeed from parents, um, but also a lot of fighting, uh, bullying, uh, a lot of narration of physical ways of experiencing schooling. I'm going to share with you um, an extract from one of the interviews um, to show an example of, of what I mean by arbitrary school um, practices. So um, this is where um, some of the people talked about what they, what they received punishments for. And for Bob, um, not his real name, but Bob at the time of interview was 36 years old. And he describes his very earliest memories of school in primary school. He says, I think once I settle, probably after the first week, I think you are very much introduced to, you know, authority and the meaning of authority. We used to do PE every morning and I think I don't think I got through one PE class because I couldn't stop talking. So you had to do PE in total silence, PE in total silence. And I couldn't achieve that. So I don't think I finished any PE classes because I always got sent back into the classroom got change and that happened for quite a while. I would have been about five, six maybe. I remember that distinctly because I could never finish. I never got through PE. And obviously as a young lad, you want to jump and scream and run about, but you had to do that in total silence. So what Bob's describing here is um, learning that the authority of the teacher is key regardless of what the, the teacher asks you to do, regardless of how meaningful or meaningless it is, in this case, um, the expectations for him, I suspect it was um, just for Bob or for a small number of children as opposed 
to the whole class to be silent during physical activity. But what you also see is a very, very young boy, despite the, the man in front of me was um, telling me this story whilst being interviewed, it was a very, very small boy um, sitting by himself in a classroom day after day whilst all of his peers, the rest of the class, are, are outside enjoying PE. Um, and this is his very first experiences and memories of school. Bob goes on um, to talk about further experiences in his primary schooling to illustrate this theme of um, educational exclusion. So this was quite key through the entire interviews that um, once the, the children had been identified as having behavioural problems or in need of discipline or in need of punishment, their education seemed to take a side step. So the focus was, was um, more on their behaviour than on their education. And here he describes an incident, again, that he remembers very clearly from his primary school. He talks about um, himself and uh, a couple of peers that were also in um, similarly positioned in the school. And he says, we were always in trouble. Always, always, always. I remember, though, distinctly that you used to get sent. If you did really neat handwriting, you'd get sent to the headmaster, show him your work and he'd give you a pen. It was a big thing, wasn't it, at school? Five of us get sent one time. First time I've been sent, you know, some kids have been sent five, six times, got six pens, always wrote in pen, but it's my first time. So headmaster looks at everybody's book, gives them all a pen, comes to me and says, yours isn't quite good enough, son, just gonna give you another pencil. And I thought, Jesus Christ, you just think, even though it's back then, it has such an effect on how you view yourself and how you then view school and how you view teaching staff. Unbelievable. But I don't know if, if that's because he singled me out as one of those people that was always there normally because I was in trouble. Um, Bob's story there does suggest... Um, that the headmaster is so used to dealing with Bob in a particular kind of way when it comes to giving him um, positive reinforcement for something he's done well at school, he can't find it within him to do so. Um, another theme that came alongside this, a very strong theme, along with um, education being um, less of a priority for the children once they had been identified as someone with um, behavioural issues, is a sense of a physical isolation. So Andy um, here describes, you're in a class with bad kids. You go to a section of the school where you, where you are away from the so-called normal kids. You're there on report. You have your dinner in a certain space. He then pauses and says, when you think about it, it was really bad. You have your dinner over there with the special kids, all these naughty kids, and the good kids were over here. It's like you're there and, and, and they're somewhere else. You get treated differently. And um, another example of this comes from Benji, who um, one of several men that I spoke to who uh, went to schools for specific schools, once excluded from mainstream school for um, children with behavioural issues. And he describes here one of those schools um, and what would happen if you were um, punished for something that you'd done. He says that there was a timeout room. It's like a cell, a police station cell, where you get locked in there and you've got a wooden table and a chair and you have to write loads of lines. They would give you a sentence on the top and then they'd say you have to do a thousand lines of these. You have to write the paper back to front and you're just locked in that room. I then asked him at this point in the interview how long he was in that room and he said for the whole day. You'd get your little exo. He's about to say the word exercise, um, which if you're not familiar is the term that's used when you um, are in prison and you come off the wings and you go outside to walk around the yard. So he says you'll get your little exo, stops himself from saying exercise realises that he's talking about school and not prison and corrects himself and says, your little playtime or whatever, to go outside. 
but you'd get that by yourself. Again, like Andy previously, Benji reflects in the interview and says, you're locked in a cell where you shouldn't have been locked in a cell as a kid. You're in school. You're getting locked in a cell by yourself to do lines. And finally, in terms of another example of physical isolation, is Jason describing um, at dinner times, he would get sent home. Um, he says, they used to send me home when I was at primary school. They'd let me have my dinner on the headmaster's table and I used to walk, and then they'd walk me home so I couldn't play in the playground with other kids. What good is that to me, to an eight, nine-year-old? He also, throughout his interview, talks about how often he was outside of the classrooms and sitting at a table uh, against a wall outside the headmaster's office. He also described um, not being outside to play and uh, PE. So he was inside often against the wall. Um, he described this table as a table that was almost his own table outside the head headmaster's office. But then he says um, on, on occasions that the teacher would let him outside, but says the teacher used to use a piece of chalk and draw a square and say I could stand in that square. Outside the front, so all the kids could, kids could see me looking through the window, and I used to have to stand there. He says that was for good behaviour, and again reflects it's just not right. So those themes, um, and there were more, um, but those are some key themes that came out of the interviews, and... Um, as they paralleled each other, and as I was listening to these themes, and obviously with my previous experience of working in prisons, there are a number of parallels um, that I was seeing between these experiences at school and what, what it is like to actually experience the prison environment. So thinking sociologically and thinking about some theories around education um, that can help us to think even more deeply about what might be happening here in terms of this relationship between um, schooling systems and sy other systems of punishment, such as prisons. Um, Bowles and Gintis, in a classic study of schooling, um, schooling in capitalist America, elaborated on Marxist principles. So these ideas that all social institutions are determined by an act to serve the pre prevailing economic system. So in a capitalist, unequal system, um, we need a, you know, an education system, uh, a media, uh, other large um, social institutions in order to uh, reinforce, legitimise, continue the system um, of, of which it's born. And so um, Bowles and Gintis argue that schools prepare people for adult work rules by socialising people to function well and without complaint in the unequal hierarchical structure of the modern corporation. They argue, Bowles and Gintis argue, that schools accomplish this goal by what they termed a correspondence principle. So this is mainly by structuring social interactions and other experiences and individual re rewards in schooling to replicate the environment of the workplace. So um, Bowles and Gintis, um, through their examination, looked at the schooling of working class children and middle class children and say that the way that these social interactions um, were organised for working class children corresponded very much to the type of work environment, um, social status, work um, ethic that they were expected to go to. So for the children of um, workers who worked in factories, their schooling mirrored or paralleled or corresponded to what it was like to work in a factory. So they had lots of um, repetitive, monotonous um, work. They were also um, 
expected to sit still, to adhere to the authority of the teacher, um, in a similar way that you might expect um, people working in manual jobs, uh, in factories, etc. But by comparison, children of middle class um, families were um, schooled in a very different way. They were encouraged to have more freedom, to um, to have, um, they were encouraged to, through their own decision making, um, in short, they were being prepared to be the boss, whereas the working class children were being prepared to be bossed, um, Balls and Ginty's argument says. So coming back to um, young people who experience exclusions at school and then go on to prison, could it be that there is um, a similar correspondence that was argued by Bowles and Gintis between working class children and, and working class jobs later in, in the adult world. And being um, a child who's facing internal and external exclusions in school and what it is to be in prison. Another thing that I considered is, could this experience of um, various exclusions actually um, create a set of skills in the same way that um, perhaps being at the other side of the school hierarchy, being quite high in the school hierarchy, prepares you for another type of environment, i.e. university. Um, so could it be that actually through experiencing these various exclusions, children become skilled to survive in a particular environment that's outside of this standard school to work trajectory? So just one more extract from the interviews that um, potentially supports this idea that, that there is a correspondence between um, schooling and prison for a small proportion of, um, of children, of young people. Um, and this idea that potentially education, schooling is preparing some people for prison. Jason, um, when asked how he felt the first time he went to prison he says well being sat outside the classrooms every day or outside the headmasters just being stuck on my own all the time so you know your mind brings yourself back to that they pushed me from pillar to post schools have um they don't want they don't give a shit about us we're shit to them and all they used to do is sit me outside on my jack jones so here i am sitting in a cell on my own that didn't bother me either. So to summarise um, my research, I'm not suggesting that the uh, imprisoned people to schooling cause them to go to prison, um, but it has been quite well established that negative school outcomes, especially school exclusion, increase the likelihood of offending. And obviously, um, if the more likely if you offend, chances are that the possibility is that you may end up being imprisoned. But what my research is arguing is that if excluded young people do go on to offend and should they become incarcerated, the shock and accompanying deterrent that you might expect from a custodial sentence is perhaps unlikely. The main features of imprisonment, so segregation from the mainstream population, hours of restricted movement and physical isolation, and a lack of stimulating activity, um, a high level of scrutiny and supervision. All of these things are features um, of prison, yes, but features that they had become all too familiar with through, through their schooling. So theoretically, um, and for sociologists thinking about, well, what does this mean about our social structures um, of both education and the criminal justice system. Punishment in the way that has been described, especially those early punishments that start very, very early in school um, and tend to, um, a lot of evidence suggests that they can make the situation worse rather than better. Disciplining children in this way rarely brings about positive changes in their behaviour. Similarly, if we look at... Um, reoffending statistics post post prison 
suggests that imprisonment is also not particularly successful in changing those behaviours. Um, it's for young offenders in particular who are incarcerated. It's a very high rate of reoffending. Um, sixty six percent of juveniles released from prison in the UK are known to reoffend, and that's known. So they may well have have done so without being um, recorded on figures. So if that's the case, and punishment doesn't punishments of these kinds doesn't appear to work to change the behaviour. Why why are we doing it? Why does society do this? One argument might be that um, the punishment is actually not aimed at the individual, but perhaps at the rest of the group. So the punishment of a child in a school is that perhaps aimed at primarily to maintain order within the rest of the class rather than um, change the behaviour of the individual. So by chastising, excluding or otherwise punishing a child or a small number of children in a school, is the purpose of that more to ensure that all others um, see this visible punishment and therefore conform to the system, um, the school system, the education system. Also, another thing to consider is how punishment is legitimised itself, of itself. So it, it is sometimes questions if it, if it appears to be excessive. But it is more or less accepted that if children, if people behave outside of particular rules, then there should be some kind of negative sanction. So the punish it, punishment itself is, is legitimised. Um, but also, is this punishment also serving to legitimise inequalities and disproportionate outcomes in schooling generally? So... Um, the people that I interviewed and the people that I worked with in prisons were typically um, at the lower end of the educational hierarchy or the school hierarchy. Um, in the same way that people at the top of that school hierarchy, so those that do particularly well from the best schools, go to the best universities, um, then go on to be the leaders and high earners in, in society. Um, and this appears to be a result of um, the meritocracy that we say happens in school, that those that are most able, that those that put in the most effort will do very well in terms of qualifications. And those qualifications can then be exchanged for um, a, a very high, a very good position in the unequal hierarchy that makes up society. And at the other end, as I've said, those that um, not only don't do well in terms of qualifications, but are also um, doubly disadvantaged by various exclusions and markers that say that they are um, d more deserving of punishment and less deserving of uh, rewards such as qualifications, good jobs, etc. So could it be that this, this punishment and this visible punishment and the effects of it is another way to... Um, not only create and maintain the unequal system that we have, but also legitimise it at the same time. So say that this is fair. There is a reason why that there are particular people from particular groups of society make up the prison population. Similarly, there's a, there's a reason why particular people from particular parts of society make up the higher echelons of society, the leaders and the well-paid So just to finish, um, a question to consider. All that I've described and thinking maybe of your own schooling and the schooling of people around you. How could this research and ideas around um, prisoner school experiences and you could easily um, kind of take out the word prisoners and insert any other marginalised group how could research looking at or thinking theory looking at those experiences be extended theoretically and in terms of thinking about the entire school system so often um, our focus is on 
those who receive negative outcomes, but less often do we think about um, the the continuum of that experience and those that are actually doing well um, because we think, well, you know, that's okay, people are doing okay. Um, but actually, if we look at the worst experiences that you can have in school, what does that tell us about the education system as a whole and, and, and what it's doing and the ways in which it works to um, arguably control, um, legitimise and maintain the unequal society in which we live. If you have um, some interest in thinking about this further, um, there's a couple of um, texts that I suggest for further reading. There is some um, excellent work by Angela Davis around prisons, thinking thinking about um, the function of prisons in society um, and how it has led, um, in the US at least, has led from previous systems. And actually, if that's the case, could it be that we can imagine a time when prisons don't exist? Um, also, you can read a little bit more about my research and uh, a very recent, last year, um, excellent report by the Institute of Race Relations on um, black working class youth and how they're criminalised and excluded in the English school system. Thanks. <laughs>